you can talk. I don't mean to. That was a bad segue. That was a bad segue. <laughs> Scratch that from the stream. Strike it from the record. Some of you folks that have been around here since this church's inception. Is that better? Does that sound better? Uh, you might know I'm in about two preachers in one service, okay? I asked Brother Ed 15 years and Brother Cliff, how many years? 20-something? I said, I don't recall two preachers in one service. Amen. Miss Patty, do you recall? Of course you have, Miss Pass. <laughs> Pastor Lee was not afraid of anything. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to resurrect that tonight. Amen. And uh, so we're going to have Brother Britt. He's going to come. Now, don't be afraid. Two preachers like, oh, no, we're going to be here till 930. Amen. But uh, no, uh, because uh, Miss Margot's uh, refreshments will just, will just deteriorate after the service if we go too long. So we will have some refreshments after the service if you'd like to stick around a little bit. Uh, but I'm so glad to have uh, Pastor Jack Britt with us uh, tonight. Um, and uh, I just love him. I've known him, good night, almost 30, probably 30 years, right? Well, when he was a school, uh, the school administrator for Brother Neeson's, the Baptist school uh, for Pastor Neeson over there in Tonawanda. And uh, now he's been, how long have you been pastoring? Uh, 20 years. So 20 years. I remember when he took, the, I remember when he took that church over at uh, um, in, uh, Cornerstone, Bi is it Cornerstone Bible Baptist Church? Right. In Rans uh, Sandville. Sandville. I keep saying Ransomville. So. Okay, good. At least I, my facts, my wrong facts were valid. Amen. How's that? I feel better. So Brother Britt's going to come and preach to us. I'm just so glad to have him. For you to get, for uh, Center Road, if you don't know him, uh, or at least of late, I know he's, he's had some connections in the past. He's going to relate to us. But I just wanted to ha uh, have you uh, just know a little bit about him and and uh, you can uh, know about his love for people, his care for people. I sure love him and appreciate him. Brother Britt, you come. Oh, I have a rich history here. I mean, I go way back. Uh, Pastor Barney Lee was taught me in Bible Institute with Brother Lou Godano and uh, Jack Seiler. I'm trying to think of the other guys that were there. Tonawanda, Brother Steve Jakey, he was the pastor at the time, and uh, he had uh, a building there. We were trying to start a church plant in the Kenmore area, and uh, Brother uh, uh, Jakey wanted to start a Bible institute, got some local pastors to get involved. Brother uh, Schriever out of uh, Folsomdale at that time, that's a long time ago. Uh, Brother Nugent, uh, all these guys in this area were the pastors that taught us uh, in uh, uh, Bible Institute, and I appreciate it. Brother Lee was my hero. I mean, I, I just tell you, I learned more from him in Bible Institute than, than any place. I remember a day we had to come out here and drop off some tests, and Brother Siler and I drove out, and, and uh, we pulled up in the parking lot, and there was Brother Lee parked in his car, and we didn't want to disturb him because his head was bowed, and we assumed he was praying. And uh, after a while, we just... We couldn't wait any longer, so because he had to get going, and so we had to interrupt him. When he did, and he lifted his head up, his face was just soaked with tears. That that, that picture is indelibly printed in my mind still. I, I I love Brother Lee and 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 Mrs. Lee, and she's still around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, praise the Lord. And uh, Brother Livermore, good friend, uh, Brother Prady, I appreciate him. We go b way back, and just. If, if people would really realize the great heritage that we have in the independent movement here in Amen. Western New York, Absolutely. and uh, I, I, I mean, I was with Brother Neeson's for 18 years, and uh, as Brother Barney said, uh, ran his Christian day school, uh, worked as his assistant, and uh, did all I could until we were called uh, to Sanborn, Ransomville at that time, and uh, uh, at the confirmation, uh, it was Brother Guadano, Brother Neeson, and Brother Constantino all said, you're going to be a good fit for that work up there, and we think you should take it. And uh, with their endorsement, we did, and we've been there, and uh, we've watched God do a great work. We bought our own building. Our building's paid for. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, what you don't know about my relationship to Center Road was I was baptized back there. Brother Steve Jenke baptized me, uh, ice cold. I remember he had to break the ice off the water. That's how cold it was. Uh, it, it was cold. And um, second thing, in my first message I ever preached was right here in the basement 
to the senior saints. My first message. I first met Brother Neeson here at this church. So there, there was a lot. Brother Lee was uh, fundamentally influential in my life and just forming me as a young Christian and encouraging me uh, into the full-time ministry. So find your way to 1 Samuel chapter 7. I should have told you that already. You know, there's a lot of historical markers in life, right? There's a lot of places that you can just put down uh, that something happened there. I read about a fellow in Rome, New York, that erected a plaque for, a bi for the bicentennial back in 1976, and he got tired of all the hoopla surrounding the bicentennial, and so he put up a plaque in his front yard that read, none, capital N, capital O, capital N, capital E, none historical marker. And then he wrote underneath that you see these metal markers, right, that says something happened on this spot at this time. And he said, on this spot in February 29th of 1776, absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> That's not true for the Bible. It's not true. For on many occasions, we find someone setting up a, a, a memorial for a genuine purpose. I think of Jacob in, in Genesis chapter 28 when he uh, set up uh, the altar after using the stones for a pillow. He set up an altar to God. And then I think of Joshua and, and, and chapter 4 and, and him taking the uh, 12 stones out of the River Jordan and putting them on dry land and then taking the 12 from dry land and putting them in the midst of the Jordan, uh, all uh, instrumental in commemorating uh, special events. And then we have here tonight uh, what we've come to, and that is 1 Samuel 7. And we find uh, uh, Samuel doing a similar thing in, in verse 12. Read with me in verse 12. The Bible says there, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, it says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shane, and called the name of it Ebenezer, Amen. saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. I want to preach on that thought tonight, lessons from a stone. You know, stones, my, my preacher used to always said, uh, they are about as good as a box of rocks. You know? <laughs> I always got a kick out of that when he said there was nothing but a box of rocks, and he was talking about people's brains. Amen? <laughs> no one is really sure of uh, Samuel's location of setting up this stone, this Ebenezer stone, as he calls it. And that word Ebenezer is significant, and it means, uh, as it says there in our text tonight, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Amen. That name Ebenezer means the stone of help, the stone of help. And I want to preach on that, that thought, the stone of help, or the lessons that we can learn from a simple stone, an inanimate object, and how important it is. So let's pray, and, and uh, let's look at this thought. I just got three quick thoughts, and I'll get out of the way, and we'll let Brother Terry come, and uh, he can do the real preaching. Amen? Father, thank you again for loving us. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this tremendous heritage here. Of, of your staying power and uh, just because of your word and, and the faith of your people to continue to go forward for thee. I pray that uh, this church would see many more years of blessings. I pray you'd fill these pews, Lord, that you'd save souls uh, before it's too late. And uh, Lord, before you come again and uh, help your people to be about your business doing those things that are honoring and glorifying to thee and thee alone. And we'll thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. The first thing I want to look at is found in verses 1 and 2. Uh, the Bible says here in chapter uh, uh, 7 and verses 1 and 2, And the men of Kerjeth Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and, sacrificed, uh, uh, and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjeth Jerim that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. If you know the story of, of this, the context here, you'll understand that years uh, prior, uh, Israel got out of the way with God. They got backslidden, right. and their hearts were no longer pursuing after the Lord as, as uh, the uh, Lord would, would uh, have them to do. And, and so they got out of the way. And uh, they, their hearts have grown cold. And, and uh, because of that, God uh, took the ark 
from their presence, took the ark out of the midst uh, of the nation of Israel. And, and if you know anything about the ark of the covenant, the ark is, is representative of the presence of God right. in someone's right. life. Right. Right. And it's so important to understand that. And, and uh, we find uh, uh, Samuel, the prophet, uh, 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 contending with the people of Israel. The Bible says in verse 3, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your heart, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. They were afraid. The Philistines had plagued Israel for years uh, since uh, the loss of the uh, of the ark, the ark was taken by the Philistines. God didn't let it stay there. Remember, they put the ark in the in the uh, temple of Dagon, and and when they did, Dagon fell on his face. They came in the morning and found the, the statue of Dagon falling down before the the ark of the covenant. And they finally got to the point. The Philistines said, uh, "We're not going to keep this thing around." And they sent it back, and it came back, and it it, it sat for years. Uh, 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 away from the people of God, they were afraid because they had gotten away from God. And 21 years, they, they were under uh, uh, the hand of the enemy, and the enemy oppressed them and, and uh, brought all kinds of trouble uh, to their land. And uh, so we see uh, the, the condition of the people. Look at verse 3 again. And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, and get away, put away your strange gods. You know, America is a, a garden of gods today. Right. The, everywhere you turn, there's, there's some uh, abomination uh, that is just idolatry. And, this, and just, if it isn't the worship of man themselves and humanity and humanism, uh, it's some other form of, of false worship. And it's, 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 it's terrible today. Well, Israel was in that same place. And, and when we see that Israel was in this place of, of uh, worshiping false gods, uh, they had to come back. And the man of God had to call them to come back. And Samuel is calling them to return unto the Lord to get their life right. If you remember, when the ark was taken and uh, Eli, the high priest, was killed, uh, his daughter-in-law uh, uh, was dying. She she uh, went into birth. Uh, she gave uh, uh, went into premature labor and and was giving birth and and died even before the birth. And and when the midwife asked what she was going to name the baby, uh, she said Ichabod. For the Lord had departed. Ichabod means for the Lord. I believe in America today. The Lord has departed. Save for. Uh, a, a handful, I should say more than a handful, because there's far more than a handful of, 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 of centers of believers like us. I still believe that, that uh, God can work in the hearts of his people if we'll let him work in our hearts. Samuel is challenging Israel to return because they had departed. Israel wasn't right with God, and you know, if Israel had been right with God, they had never had taken the ark. You know, it's really easy to drift away from God if you're really not centered in love with Jesus Christ. Right. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we can only live this life that we live today uh, that we call Christian if we live it by faith. For without faith it is impossible to please God and he that cometh to God must believe he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. We need uh, to definitely uh, turn to God. America needs to turn back to God as, as the challenge from the man of God is for us to do so like Samuel did with Israel. Amen. The Bible says, uh, uh, you know, you could be in church, you could go to church and still be in dire straits. you realize that? There's a lot of people that come to church and they're still not right with God. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 5.14, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. We can get away from God. We can go through the motions. But if we don't return to God, if there's not a true repentance in the heart of the people of God, 
we're never going to see a revival in America. Solomon is, is, is said that the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Solomon was saying that 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 the backslider has a uh, the backsliding of a of, of a person away from God has a way of catching up with them. The prophet Jeremiah said the same thing when he said in in chapter fourteen verse seven, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many, and we have sinned against thee. You know. When you get away from God, there's nothing but heartache by the mile. There's just misery and, and unhappiness. Right. You know, I, I can't, I, I probably get backslidden every day. I, I just, I'm not saying I'm a backslider at heart, but I, I, when I'm not right with God, even in the simplest way, in the thoughts of my mind or in my heart or my attitude, I, I, I don't like it, and, and it, it just makes me unhappy and, and miserable. And so I have to turn back to God, and I'm thankful for the promise of 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if we'll confess our sins, yeah. he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The condition of the people was uh, that their hearts were away from God. My question tonight is this, where's your heart? Where's your heart? You know, that Ebenezer stone was, was raised as a remembrance. We'll see that in just a minute, but it was raised as a remembrance. And we need to remember, amen, how important it is that we have a right heart with God. When Samuel said, return, uh, in verse 3 there, look at their response in verse 4. The Bible says, then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Then the children of Israel did put away those false gods. They did it. They didn't talk about it. They didn't think about it. They did it. We need to leave this place tonight with a heart of contrition, a, a time of repentance, a time that we're sorry for our sin, and I mean genuinely sorry for what we do. Most cases, we're just sorry we get caught and not sorry for what we've done in our offense to God. Do you realize we're going to stand before God one day and you're going to give an account of your life? I'd want to make sure that when I left this world, amen, I, I don't know when I'm going to leave. Do you? I want to make sure my heart's right. It was a place of repentance. Jeremiah, again, chapter 3, verse 22 says, Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art. Uh, 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 we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Return, the Bible says, and God will heal you. I'm glad that God is a keeper of His promises. Right. We serve a God that cannot lie, and He tells the truth. Right. And if you'll turn to Him, God will make things right. God wants us to return. He wants us in a place where he can fellowship with us and enjoy our company. God loves us. I like the verse where it talks about God thinketh upon me. I'm glad that every day he thinks upon me. Am I worthy of his thinking? He thinks so. Whether I do or not, don't matter. He loves me. It was a place of repentance. Number two, I want you to see that it was a place of revival. The repentance was followed by a revival. Real yeah. revival will follow true repentance. Yeah, right. For repentance is the prerequisite to any revival. Right. Right. I'm talking about a real revival right. now. I don't think most right. of us... Now, we're talking about having a revival meeting that's in hopes of getting a real revival. Right. Now, I've seen maybe one or two in my lifetime real revivals right. and real movings of God... Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really, it's something you see and experience. Right. And when God's really in it, you will see a genuine revival. Now, it might not be a national revival. It might not be a statewide revival. It can, though, be a local revival. Right. And I think right now we're shooting for revivals in our churches. Right. And that's why we have meetings like this, to get our hearts yeah. right, right so that we'll right. be 
God's calling us back to him to get us ready because he's coming again and he wants us to be ready. It was a place of revival. There's a couple uh, of things here I want you to see. I want you to see the evidence and the, the effects of that revival. The people were moved. That's the effects. A real revival will stir people's hearts. And when a real revival comes, the people of God will be moved. They'll be moved to change, not just emotionally. There'll be a genuine change. That's what repentance means. It's a change of mind that, that results in a change of action. Look at verse 6. The Bible says there, And they gathered together at Mitzvah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel. There's a couple of things I want you to see here. First off is the pouring out of the water. What were they doing when they were pouring out that water? Well, they'd have had to fill it up a bucket, right? Well, uh, to fill up the bucket and to pour out that water was them describing in an action how serious they were. Someone wrote, we would desire, this is what they were saying when they brought the bucket of water and poured it out before the Lord, we would desire, on account of our sins, to shed so many tears as there are drops in this bucket. But because we are unable to do that, nor have we the tears needed, hence to, we pour out this water in that stead. They used the pouring out of the bucket of water in the presence of God to show their seriousness. They were serious. You know, in the old days, uh, when people were serious about something, uh, they would put on sackcloth and ashes as, as a visible sign of a changed heart. You know, we get baptized today, not for salvation, but for identity. When you get baptized, you're, you're, you're publicly declaring your conversion, your salvation, right. and you're telling people that you've been born again. Why? Because they can't see what happened in your heart. When they poured out that bucket of water, they're, they're pouring it out before the Lord, and they're telling the Lord that they were serious. Amen. The Bible says in verse 6, also they fasted. You know, fasting is a, a, the depriving of oneself in a physical way into, in order to uh, ascribe to something spiritual. That's why we fast. We have very little preaching on fasting today. But as a people, we need to get back to that fasting and praying. We see their condition. The Bible says again in verse 6 that they sinned against who? Say it. Read that with me. Against the Lord. Now, we sin against each other, yes, but, and we need to get that right. But they sinned against the Lord. And now they didn't want anything to come between them and the Lord. And then finally we see they confessed their sin. We have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel. The people were moved about their spiritual condition. In verse 8 we see that renewal again of prayer and that change of action. Look at with, uh, verse 8 with me. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that we will, he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. When, when real revival comes, uh, one of the evidences of it will be a change in people's attitude towards prayer. Do you have a prayer meeting here, brother? Do you have it on Wednesday? Like a midweek prayer meeting? I, I, I'm not going to even ask you how many come. Amen? But if it's anything like my church... It's not many. I think that needs to change. I think that needs to change in a big way. I think the whole church needs to be in prayer on Wednesday when the church comes together. That's why we call it prayer meeting and Bible study. We have a monthly prayer meeting on a Friday night once a month. I do that just so that I emphasize prayer in the church and the importance of prayer. They had a new attitude. Prayer was important. They were moved, and it, it was manifested. It was evident in their life. And when it did, they saw the power of God. Look at what happened when they prayed, and Samuel prayed. And the Bible says, The children said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near 
to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them, and they were smitten before the Lord. Hey, listen, we don't see great things, and we get discouraged because uh, we haven't prayed and done the things that God's called us to do. Uh, we've gotten away from God. Uh, there's very little repentance, and we're not going to see revival until there's a new attitude in God's people uh, about this thing of loving God. It was a place of repentance. It was a place of revival. And then lastly, and I'll be done, verse 12, it was a place of remembrance. Verse 12, he says, and he took the stone and set it between Mitzvah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. You know, when we get to that place where we take that stone, that stone of remembrance, and we place that. He, he placed that stone there so that every time somebody went by there, you know, they say that uh, history or tradition says that they just, it was a simple stone that somebody found. I don't know how big that stone was. It, I, I imagine it was big enough to be significantly seen as you pass that way, right? You would imagine that, right? Okay? And, and, and tradition says that they wrote the name Ebenezer on there. They carved it into the stone. And so every time someone would go by that stone of remembrance, they would remember what happened for the children of Israel by God in delivering them from the Philistines. If you were to read on, you would find that so the Philistines, look at verse 13, and so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Amen. All those years that they had been under the oppression of the oh. enemy and now they were delivered and no more to be troubled by the enemy. That doesn't mean if we get right with God and we put up an Ebenezer stone somewhere that we're going to uh, uh, be delivered from every problem and trouble that, that happens. That, that's just not going to happen. But the point is that you can look back to that time that God delivered. Can you remember those times that God did something great for you? Joe B.A.'s back there. He's my, my granddaddy in the Lord. I remember the day he showed up to my house because I was backslidden. And he came into my house. I had a pack of cigarettes in my top pocket. I'm not proud to say that, but I did. I was a young Christian, and I'm glad there were people like Joe B.A. around who was willing to come after me uh, when I wasn't showing up in church. So the next time somebody shows up at your door because you haven't been coming to church, don't get mad at them, amen? Thank God for them. Well, he came in, I had that pack of cigarettes in my top pocket, and he was bold enough to take those cigarettes out of my pocket and crunch them up in front of my face and throw them in the garbage. I'll never forget that, amen? I'll tell you something, it endeared me to him that he was bold enough to, be, to do that because I knew he loved me. It just was a declaration. It was one of those memorable things that I'll never forget. I can think back to all the times, the great things that God has done. You know, we miss so much. We forget so much of all the things. You know, I'd have wished I would have wrote down every time God blessed me in a big way or a little way. I wished I would have journaled it and wrote it down because I'd have a book this thick. Of all the times God blessed me and all those blessings that God gives us. That, that stone was placed there as a memorial to how good God's been to the people of Israel. We've got to place an Ebenezer somewhere in our life so that we'll remember how good God's been to us. He's blessed us and in ways beyond imagination. You know, only eternity is going to tell us exactly how great and how extensive uh, the blessings are. Can I share with you a blessing tonight? Real quick, and then I'll finish up. I'm done. This uh, fella uh, came to church last night, and he said, I don't think you remember me. And I said, I apologize, but I don't, because I've met a lot of people in life, and so have you. And I said, you look a little familiar. He says, my name is 
Chris Witherell. I said, Chris Witherell, you rode my bus. He rode my bus when he was seven or eight years old. He came back with his family. He brought his wife and two children, and they came, and he said, I, I searched you out. He looked for me to come back. He said, we're looking for a church, and we want to get right with God. I know he was serious because he came back in the evening service as well. All of those are stones of remembrance because hitherto God has helped us. God has helped us along the way and blessed us along the way. And we need to learn to put up our Ebenezer stone as, as a stone of remembrance of what God has done. You know, if I could encourage you tonight to do one thing, start writing your blessings down. Write them down so that when, when you're, and I'm, I'm guaranteeing this, there's going to come times that you're so dejected you won't, you won't think God's within a million miles of you. But if you go and you look up uh, uh, those things that you wrote down and the blessings that God gave you, what a difference that'll make in your life to keep your heart where it needs to be for God so that we can continue in this thing that God has called us to do as we go through this life, giving out the gospel, amen, and letting God work in our life and being a glory to him and for his honor. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for loving us. Thank you for your kindness and your truth. And, Lord, I pray that, that uh, you would just use something tonight that was said uh, in this message on the Ebenezer Stone and how, Lord, we have to keep uh, in memory all the blessings that come from you that have been in our life. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Uh, heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's all stand just for a moment. Well, what a thought. Let's all stand. No, uh, no repentance, no revival. No repentance, no revival. And no revival and no return and no renewal. That means we're not going to be ready. But you know what struck me, Brother Britt, is that victory that God brought over the Philistines, it was not a product of what the Jews did. They didn't, you know, get together and assess their military possibilities and, and get together and draw battle lines and to defeat the enemy. They came together, got right with God, fasted and prayed, and God did it. We were just talking uh, at prayer meeting tonight uh, before the service um, with Brother Terry, and we were just, just reflecting on yesterday and, and how God just put all that together. And not, I said it was, not an, it was not a product of our, you know, human uh, intelligence, education, experience. It was just something that God put together. And God's done things in your life, and, and uh, there's some things that, that, uh, we need, that we can look back to and say, praise God, you did that. I remember a friend of mine, he said, I want to be somewhere in life. I want to do something in life that might be so difficult, but it is where it proves demonstrably beyond the shadow of a doubt. It was God and not me. Have you done, ha has there been moments like that in your life? Miss Patty is going to pray, uh, is going to play. And uh, would, you, would you think about that? Would you, would you can you respond to that and think about spaces in your life that God did something special. God answered prayer. God came through in a time of need. But would you thank him for that tonight? You, you, were, you were in desperate straits. You were in dire straits. You were, uh, your back was against the wall and you needed, you needed an answer. You needed uh, God to come through. You needed help. You needed uh, money. You needed an answer. You needed help dealing with somebody. You needed help in a decision, in an, in the midst of all of those difficult times, it was dark, and, and there was maybe five different doors you can walk through, and God just took your hand and led you right through it. How about, how about thanking him for that, amen? Would you thank him for those times in your life when God did that? It was something that God did, and you know it. You know that it was not a result of the work of your hands. Bible so clear that he rebukes men who worship the work of their hands. Where we as humans, we're Christians, but man, we, 
We could be Christian humanists in the closet. And all we think about and all we dwell upon is what we can do, what we can produce. God help us. Would you take some time tonight and just thank him for the times that he showed up and he came through and uh, he wrought the victory somewhere, sometime in your life. Praise God for a Joe B.A. Uh, who came along and told you the truth when you didn't want to hear it. You know, we have such a soft view of love today. Right? Love is, uh, is, is sensitive, tiptoeing around the tulips. Sometimes love is snatching cigarettes out of your pocket and crushing it right in front of your face. Now, I'm sure Brother Joe doesn't make a, a professional ministry out of that. The cigarette crusher. But at that moment, that was a manifestation of love between him and God doing something in Brother Britt's life and using him to do it. Amen. God can do such great things with us. Boy, I'm excited. Amen. I'm excited for this meeting, and I hope that that this something strikes a chord in your heart about repenting from some things that are holding you back from being a blessing to others. And God using you, that God can, write, write, uh, can bring about a victory in someone else's life through you. Not as a product completely because of you, but through you. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look up here just for a moment. Let's have our ushers come forward. Sure appreciate that, Brother Britt. Sure love you and appreciate your spirit. Amen. So uh, we, we structured this in the service because it's easier to grab your wallet when you're standing up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, uh, the time of the offering is just as much a part of worship than responding to the invitation. Just as much a part of worship as an opening prayer or helping someone, counseling somebody at the altar, this time is just as holy and just as special. And my challenge for you is, well, you, for this revival meeting, that you'd, you'd be a blessing and be a help to this meeting, right? And, you know, it's, uh, you know I liken it to uh, when you go to a restaurant, you have a wonderful meal, I hope you don't get up and leave without paying. That wouldn't be a good idea, amen. But you've come tonight, and you've heard some great things. you heard some great things, and you've enjoyed a wonderful meal. The beginning of this week into, into this week. Would, well, I'm challenging you. Uh, pay and leave a tip, amen. That's what it's about, amen. It's, it's showing appreciation at this time in, uh, in, in the service and in the week. Brother Dan Ranback, would you pray for our offering this evening? The, again, these offerings go right to the preachers, so, uh, be, so be a blessing to them. Amen. You may be seated.
didn't mention it last night, but these are original numbers. These ladies wrote those numbers, amen? So we praise the Lord for that. Um, Brother Terry, you come and preach to us, okay? Amen, Pastor. Thank you. Preacher. Thank you, ladies. The second song was the one my, well, the first one of this group uh, was the one that Heather had written. And thank the Lord for the talent that the Lord has given her. While I'm testifying, I just want to say thank you to Heather and to Melody. We're still traveling with mom and dad. We know they're a PK. God pastor for 21 years, and they've certainly been around the ministry all their life. And at their ages of 26 and 21, they could be doing whatever, but they choose to be with mom and dad. So we're grateful for that. And I know one of these days, God has sent along some young man, and that all changed. But in the meantime, mom and I are enjoying it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, for that message. And I, it's one of my favorite series in the Word of God is there in Samuel, Samuel 7, 8, 14, 17. And about a, I have about a five or six series on the Ebenezer. So I'm praying, since he got me started on it, I'm praying that this week is an Ebenezer week for Center Road Baptist Church. I'm praying that God gets in on it and it changes something in your life. And I'm already sensing that's what's going on. I appreciate those with the sensitivity to the Spirit of God, even at the point of physical pain, to even try to get down to worship the Lord. And God understands that. And, and you know, if you even just sit on the front pew and bow your head, that's acceptable to him. Jacob leaned on his staff and worshiped. There it is. The bowing, kneeling, and prostrating ourselves on the ground in honor and adoration of our Savior. And he's worth it tonight, isn't he? Well, i got to get focused on get start preaching because that would be the first message. But anyway, we're in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, no, not chapter 7. I know that's traditional, but we're not doing that tonight. Maybe tomorrow, but tonight's in chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26, right after check Second Chronicles chapter 25. When you, <laughs> just trying to help you out. When you found your place, would you stand with me? It's not for me, it's with me as we honor the perfect word of God. I don't know about you folks, but I thoroughly enjoyed yesterday. I enjoyed the sweet presence of our Lord showing up last night as we bowed before him and enjoyed him. And I believe, how many was not here last night? Okay, there's just, just a couple. Then the rest of you know what we're talking about. To my knowledge, everybody was bowing and enjoying, worshiping God. And I believe God was pleased with that. So here we are tonight in Second Chronicles chapter 26. Then... All the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jochaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebneth and the wall of Eshdod and the cities about Eshdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelled in Gurabel and the Mahinans and the Amorites gave gifts unto Uzziah and his name spread abroad even into the entering of, the, of Egypt for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley of the wall and fortified them and he built towers in the desert and dig many wells 
for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also, and the vine dressers in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands, according to the number of their account by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Messiah, the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. This was a 2,600 man strong elite forces. Talk about special forces. That's who these guys were. Under the hand of the uh, was an army, 300,000 and 700,000 and 500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets and habitants and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows with great stones withal. And his name was spread far abroad for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Let's pray right there, Father. As we look at this Old Testament narrative, I pray that your sweet spirit would swoop in right now. Take thy word and illumine it to our hearts. Burn its message deep within us where it becomes the conviction of our soul. Let the lost, Lord, tonight be convinced of their need of a Savior, that they may repent of their sin and put their faith in you. Lord, I'm praying that the lost get saved. And the saved tonight, God, I'm praying you continue to stir the fires of yesterday eve. And, Lord, I pray that this week will truly be an Ebenezer for Central Road Baptist Church. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, the title tonight is this. Uzziah the King developed and died from LDDS. Well, amen. Uzziah the king developed and died from LDDS. We're going to take, with God helping us tonight, a look at King Uzziah, who he was, and how that he started out strong, but why he did not finish strong. His life was characterized by LDDS, Latter-day Decline Syndrome. <laughs> hey, come on, with all these things going on today, I figured it'd fit, amen. How many remember yesterday when we was in Isaiah 6? Okay, two of us, good. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Remember the context? Uzziah was the king. So in studying this, I got curious. Who is King Uzziah? Found out that he was the king of Judah. Then I found out that Uzziah... He didn't finish so good. He didn't finish strong. So then the Lord gave me this message, and I was thinking, how many want to finish strong? I do. Amen. Sincerely, I really do. Been at this 42 years. I want to finish this thing well. To finish well at the end of our life. So here's a follow-up question, and this is very serious. How many then are willing to pay the price of humility to do so? Yeah. So who is King Uzziah? Number uno, that's one for English-speaking people. Isaiah started out right. That's the easy point, isn't it? 
In the first five verses, we kind of get a little bit of summary. He became a king at 16 years old. And I'm thinking he could do a better job than our 86-year-old president. But anyway, don't get me sidetracked. He was a godly young man. That's what made the difference. And the Bible was very clear and told us that he did that which was right in the sight of God. Folks, that ought to be our motive in our life. Is it right in the sight of God? Not if it's popular, not if it's in, not if it's hip, not if it's... No, 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 no. Is it right in the sight of God? Notice that he did it what was right in the sight of the Lord, not public opinion. Would to God we had some leaders today that wanted to do what's right in the sight of God without it being a PC, right. uh, political correctness. Amen. I'm not very political correct. You figure that out by now. Uh, or he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and not some school or some fellowship. Right. Folks, our, our one we give an account to is God. And because here he is as a youth, 16, the Bible considers that a youth, he's starting out right. He's starting out strong. And as he served God, God's blessings was upon him, it says in the first five verses, as long as he sought the Lord. So let us take a look at some of the blessings in, God, in, in Uzziah's life. So that's number two already. God's blessings. Number two is God's blessings. Back to our text here. So verse number six. So Jotham. Uh, wait a minute. That's a different chapter. Good message. Just a different chapter. <laughs> chapter 26, verse six. And Uzziah went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him. Do you see that? And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gerubel and the Mahimans and the Amorites gave gifts unto Uzziah and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Amen. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall uh, and fortified them. And he built towers in the deserts and dig many wells. And he had much cattle, and both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also, vine dressers, and in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. I want you to notice the Bible's very clear here. He started out a young man who did that was right in God's eyes. God blessed that, and as long as he sought after the Lord, God blessed him. Okay? I'm being oversimplistic on purpose to drive home on point. Folks, if churches want the blessings of God again in our day, we're going to have to get back to follow what the Bible says about it, not this emergent junk that's out there, not this ecumenical thing going on. Oh, no, we need to get back to the old King James Bible. And thus saith the Lord, he told us what the church is about. He started it himself. Amen the captain he's the preeminence it's his church and we ought to play along the rules here and he helped Uzziah and God gave him a name and there's too many preachers out there looking to get themselves a name and they want to write into the sword and bring about these inflated numbers of baptisms or, or people getting saved and this kind of thing and I'm not necessarily against folks bragging on Jesus as long as it's about Jesus instead of their own kingdom and their own empire and look at this iconic worship that's going on how shot ourselves in the foot folks God's not in that but God gave Uzziah a name and he gave him some fame uh, in fact clear over the internet in of Egypt he can walk along the border of Egypt and say hey do you ever hear about Uzziah yeah man God's all over that young man man he's whooping the Philistines he's a chicken chicken king amen well amen because God gave him a strong military and God gave him a strong military. It was very plain in the scripture that helped the king against the enemy. 
God gave him a military that helped the king against the enemy. And they had the, the latest in technology. And, and Time out just a second. Did you know that the Holy Spirit wrote the word of God? Okay, so that means he never stuttered when he wrote it. He never got to a place where, ah, I need two more verses. He never did that. He started somewhere on purpose. He went somewhere on purpose. And he finished on purpose. So if he took time out in the middle of all these blessings to tell us that Uzziah had some cattle in the low country and in the high country and was in husbandry, how's, how's that fit the context of this? That's nothing to do with the military. That's not how the mighty military men of valor help the king against the enemy. You know, so, so why would it be there? It's not there by accident because the Holy Ghost didn't make any accidents when he wrote the word of God. Y'all have faith in the word of God like that? So then I got thinking about this. You know what he did? He just bragging on God's blessings on this man. God blessed him because he did that was right in God's sight. Sin a road, you want God to bless you? You do what's right in God's sight. Right. Yeah, I mean, you want to get you a name? You do what's right in God's sight. Right. Yeah, you want to get some fame? You do that what's just right in God's sight. And here's the kicker. You know why he put in there about them, that husbandry, and, and you know, which is vineyard dressing and, and his cattle? Because he enjoyed it. Right. Did you realize when you do what's right in God's sight, he just gives you some things, not necessarily for the military or for the, that particular purpose, but just because you like it. Yes. See, our Heavenly Father, He likes to spoil His children. And I, being one of His children, I like to spoil it. Amen. Amen. I like it when God blesses. Amen. But here's the thing Why? what He's blessing obedience. He did that which was right in his sight. God gave him a name. God gave him fame. And here's a bunch of cattle because uh, you like it. Isn't that a blessing to y'all? Isn't it true? Has there not been times that God just gave you the desire of your heart because mm, you want to one? Sure, he meets our needs. But looking around, I dare say, God's blessed us way more than just meeting our needs. I got a whole bunch of wants, don't you? Amen. Sure do. Amen. He's blessed. Sure do. To his name be the glory. Amen. Yeah, well, amen. So back to the military. Then he not only strengthened him and give these mighty men of valor to help the king and gave him a name and gave him fame and a Strong military, and oh yeah, don't forget the cattle and the husbandry just because he likes it. Vine dresses in a mountain in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Just because he enjoyed it. Folks, our God's good. And then he gave him the latest technology and weaponry of the day. In fact, let, let me show you here. Uh, look back at verse 11. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to, the, according to their number, account by the hand of Jael and the scribe and the Messiah and an order, excuse me, the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains, and he gave him some special forces. The whole number, the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. Isn't it funny how the Bible counts? You have to do math to get to the same number. You know, that's 2,600, but 2,600, that's just a cool way to say it, isn't it? Yeah, well, hang on to this, and you thought that was neat. Well, check this out. And under the hand of the army, 300,000 and 7,000. Yeah, what's that number? 307,000. Everybody with me? <laughs> oh, yeah, don't forget, and 500. <laughs> so that's 307,500. That's an army. That made war with mighty power. Look, look, look. To help the king against the enemy. 
And now Uzziah, he's involved, verse 14. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets and habergens and bows and slings to cast stones. I mean, they had the latest in the weaponry of their day. And that's a, you know why? Because he did that which was right in the sight of God, and God blessed him. And God blessed him. And God blessed him. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. This is this Uzziah we're talking about. And, and the mighty men to whoop the army, special forces, and all these weapons. And you know what are you talking about? Habungeons. Yeah, you know what that is, don't you? Well, I didn't. That's why I had to look it up. Yeah, that habergen is a sleeveless coat of mail or scale armor. Ooh, now I know what it is. That wasn't good enough. I think, I don't know what it is still. Anybody know what it is yet? I'll keep going. All right. It, it was a noun, meaning a thing. Person, place, a thing. It was a thing. Okay, playing a game here. A protective garment made of linked metal rings. Metal. Or of the overlapping of metal plates. It was a coat of mail or armor to defend the neck and the breast. It was formed of little iron rings united and descended from the neck to the middle of the body. You ever see the old knights? Under the knight's armor, you take this off, they have on a habergen, if I'm pronouncing it right. Okay? And it was all these tiny little rings, like, put together. And that way, if somebody came up and went, oh, yeah, chop, with a sword, it tink, and it wouldn't cut them. I remember when I was in college, I worked at Hardy's, and they had roast beef. And it was a rule at Hardy's, you had to put on that metal glove to cut the roast beef. And it was a metal glove with these rings. So I thought, oh, I got that picture. It's like, if you forgot that, sounds, whoa, oops. And then somebody got some fresh meat. <laughs> Not a good idea. So this idea here is it protected them. The neck, you know, from being chopped or stabbed. And I thought, well, body armor. I'm good for body armor. Do y'all like body armor? I mean, that's a wonderful thing. And wait, that was just, that was just one. Notice what else. In verse 15, and he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. <laughs> engines? What is an engine? Well, I looked it up. Here's what it says. Let me find it. Here where I have it. Engine, engine. Where did I put engine? Okay, I'm trying to find it. Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh. Here it is. Engine. A machine with moving parts that converts into power. <laughs> Sometimes Webster doesn't help me. Okay? So I have to dig a little more. And these engine was like an old-time wagon with wood wheels. And they had like a tree cut and tied together ropes that formed like a, an, a triangle. There was two triangles on this wagon with wood wheels. I've got your picture. And leather straps held these two triangles together so it wouldn't fall over. And then from this top beam that went across was two more leather straps that came down and had a tree that it was wrapped around so that when you pull back on it, it's like this, sing, 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 okay? So if you pull up to the door, of a fortified city, they pull that thing back and let her go. Smack! <laughs> Don't do that. Okay? But anyway, you do that a few times, it busts the door down. That's an engine. But he said he built towers. And he put engines on the towers. There aren't any doors on the towers. What good is a clean thing going to do you? So God gave him some very cunning men. Did you realize wisdom comes from God? Did you realize that's why Washington doesn't have any? 
Because, I'm serious here, the beginning or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hello? Okay. So anyway, what these were then were these kind of machines that had a long pole with a bucket kind of thing, and they had a crank and a crank back, tick, 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 and they put arrows and stones in there, and they pulled the lever, let her fly, Bubba, and on the tower, it was like a catapult, and it rained down stones and arrows on the enemies. Hey, you couldn't buy this on Amazon. It didn't happen yet. He's like the first dude on the corner with this cool tool. You are meant, this is God's blessing him. He gave him a name. He gave him fame. He gave him cattle and, and vineyards just because he loved it. And, and he gave men with smarts and cunning wisdom to design, to the, to design weaponry that, they, that gave him a serious edge. Why? Because he did that which was right in the sight of God. Everybody with me? All right, don't make me start over. I am having fun, but we need to keep moving. All right. Well, the Bible says here, and I look at the last part of verse 15, and we'll move on. For he was marvelously helped. If you're helped right here, marvelously helped up here. Help, marvelously helped. Okay? I like the marvelously part. I like help too, but I like marvelously. For till he was strong. All right. Number three. But pride led to his destruction. Verse 16. The scripture takes a hard turn to the left right here. Oh, this is our warning. Verse 16. But did you see that word? But Uzziah, God blessed him, but Uzziah, God blessed him because he did that was right in God's sight, but don't let there be a but in your life. But when Uzziah was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. What? Hang on, king. You're not allowed to burn incense. Mr. King Uzziah, that is an overreach of your authority. The only one that was allowed to burn incense in the temple were the priest. Look at me. No man has the right or the authority to dictate to anyone else when, where, or how we worship God. And any time a government gets involved in church business to tell us how to worship, that's called tyranny. And we, as God's children, if we're going to do it right in his sight, we're going to worship God anyway according to the dictates of his word. Amen? Amen? Boy, you talk about relevant. Yes, sir. You know, the preachers here, we have it easy. God gave us a book. It's already relevant. Yeah. All we have to do is preach it. I mean, you see any relevancy going on here? You've known anything about governors or, or uh, presidents overstepping their authority here and getting in God's business? Well, that's exactly what happened here. <laughs> you know, and I want to say I'm glad for the technology of the streaming. But if you're going to have church, you have to assemble. That's what the word means. In other words, sitting at home right now in your little easy boy with your PJs on, sipping a big old mocha from Starbucks is not church. It's not. Church is a called out assembly of baptized believers following the great commission to God. How are you assembled if you're sitting over there playing with your easy boy? That's not assembled. And people abuse this thing as an excuse 
to lacken up on their commitment to God. Folks, the Waldensies met in the woods and in the caves that our ancient ancestors, the Baptists, they, they, they met at the risk of their own life, and many of them did die for assembling. Don't tell me that church attendance wasn't important to our Baptist brothers. Amen. 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 But here's what happens now. See, when one gets kingitis in their life, they think that they have the right to make the final decisions in their life, and that will lead to them having LDDS, and oftentimes LDDS is fatal, such as the case King Uzziah. We started out strong, and God blesses us. That's his pattern. He's good. Then we start getting too big for our britches. I mean, after all, everybody knows my name, Uzziah said. And they're scared of me. Because I got these geniuses, these smart dudes. They come up all cool with weaponry. I'll just nuke them. And since I'm the king, King Itis was setting in, I make my own decisions. No, 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 no. But sometimes when you and I have been walking with the Lord and God blesses us, it gets awful slippery on top. Because we start thinking we're the ones that done something. And we didn't do nothing. And then we take the right back from God and say, no, I'm going to make my own decisions now. That's idolatry. It's called selfishness. Do we not live in a self-absorbed society? I mean, they even name things like iPad, iPhone, i this, i that. It's all about me, baby. Amen. Yeah, I have an iPhone, but that wasn't why. <laughs> so the latter-day decline syndrome sets in when our king-itis turns into a God complex. Oh, not that you and I are out creating our own universes, but we're playing God in our own life in the fact that we have the right to make our own final decision. Say, well, I mean, don't go to sleep now that we're just getting in the meat of this thing. You know what caused that? Pride. It reeks in the houses of God. Because we're not like them. Praise God, we're not. I give you that. But in our arrogance, we think, well, if I sin, if, you know, I happen to sin, it's not as bad as their sin. I said, don't go to sleep on me now. I'll wake you up. Stay with me. So we've been saved 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We established that yesterday. In fact, I'll just be transparent with your people. I am an evangelist. I've been in this a long time. You know how hard it is for me to admit that I've sinned? Because I should know better. I do know my doctrine really well. I'm not a first-day student. I know the book. Oh, not everything. I'll give you that little humility. Wasn't that humble, brother? Isn't that good of me? Okay. But when we have a bad attitude and we're not so kind to our wife, that's okay with God? Well, I think it is. I mean, I'm the evangelist. And I'll tell him sorry while I'm driving through traffic. Come oh, on, get out of the way, God. You know I'm sorry. <laughs> like nothing. And I'm not saying that we need to crawl on our knees five miles and do some kind of penance and kiss a statue or something. One, I'm not kissing anything. But I believe that the nonchalant 
lackadaisical attitude toward our sin against God stinks in his nostrils. All right, let me, let me take it one more step since we're having fun now. Look at my eyes. Here's what I see across America, and I do see a lot of people love God, brother. That's been a real encouragement to me being on the road for seven years. But I also notice that their eyes are like mine. They're dry. Can I? I'm going to ask. I'm not being mean. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck right now, okay? Maybe later, but not right now. When's the last time you've wept real tears? It came down your eye and dripped off your cheek because you offended him. Oh, and I get mad at the girls and the filth they're doing and the stupidity they don't even know what bathroom to go to. Are you serious? And I'll ride that horse till it dies. I'll ride him into the ground. And God says, son, what about your pride? What pride? Oh, you told me you were sorry, but there's no repentance. There's no change. Oh, I'm not talking about we're really bummed because the consequences stink. Well, the woodshed's designed to stink, you know. I mean, the spankings aren't fun. But before I go to the woodshed, wouldn't it be refreshing to God if Terry would have a few tears of remorse saying, God, I'm really sorry I hurt your feelings. Hey, you want to use some Bible words here? I'm sorry for grieving your spirit. I'm sorry for quenching you. What happened? Well, I got king Idas. And my king, I just turned it into a God complex where I think I'm boss of my own life now. Because it's slippery on top. I know the blessings of God. I have been spoiled. Oh, not because of Terry, but his goodness. Is this making sense? See, I don't like preaching messages like this, honestly, because you know that makes me all the more accountable. So maybe let the pastor preach the hard ones. I'll preach some little warm and fuzzy one or something. Amen. So let's see what he did in his LDDS, Latter day Syndrome. Let's see what happened when King Idas turned into God complex to him. It's verse 17. I, I'm not making this up. When you preach, you preach what the text says. Here's what the text says. Look at verse 17. We just let God's word speak for itself. Look at verse 17. And Azariah the priest went after him. Wait a minute. Let's back up. Verse 16. And when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. And went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Well, he's in tyranny right now. And Azariah the priest, praise God for a priest with a backbone, went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. So you have 81 priests coming in after the king, not afraid of him at all. Thank God for preachers who's going to just keep the doors open and worship God till Jesus comes back, regardless of what any king overstepping his boundaries tells us to do. And they withstood Uzziah the king. Oh, I appreciate these 81 men. And they said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast transgressed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. You know what a surefire test is to see if you're struggling with a God complex? To see if you're struggling with King Idas is when you're rebuked, how do you handle it? Well, let's see how King Uzziah handled it and see if he's got a God complex going on. Verse next, 19, in case you lost your place. Then Uzziah was wroth. Oh, 
just told on himself. His angry spirit showed him they were dead on the money here. He, they, were, they rebuked him, and he got mad. See, wrath is wrath, and wrath is like anger on steroids. So this king is having himself a kingly fit and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. I mean, he come ready to do this transgression. And while he was wroth with the priest, I mean, anger on steroids, the lamp received and arose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests, all 81 of them, looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. You know what it means to be thrust out? They grabbed the hold of the king with more fear of God than fear of man. It appertaineth not unto thee, O king, to do what you're doing. God said that belongs to Aaron's sons, and only if they've been consecrated, you're out of line. And when God began to judge him, they grabbed a hold of him and thrust him out. Thank God for some men of God willing to stand right square on the scripture and say, uh-uh, you've crossed the line. Amen? Some of you all look at me funny now. Everything's all fine when he's blessing with little cool visions on towers. <laughs> but when God's judging, it's not so fun anymore, is it? All right, let's go on. Where did I leave off? What verse? 21. And Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death, Wait a minute, I missed verse 20. Let's put it in reverse. Okay, verse 20. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. So they're thrusting him out. He realized he just fell under the judgment of God and is now a leper, and he begins to run out himself because he knows he's under the judgment of God. Okay? Everybody with me? All right, I'm going to read the rest of the story. And then I have two more comments and we're done. Now we're ready for... 21. And Isaiah the king was a leper until the day of his death, and dwelt in the several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Isaiah, the first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amaz, write. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, 1. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. This is that Uzziah who started out strong but had latter day decline syndrome and it took his life. Listen to me. He was cut off from the house of the Lord. How tragic is that? He couldn't even just show up and worship now. He couldn't come at all, period. He could no longer enjoy the position of king. And he certainly enjoyed that. And rightfully so, it was a blessing of God to him. He lost his ability to judge God's people. He lost his honor. He was buried with the kings in the field. The kings were buried in sepulchers. He was still in the field of the kings, but he wasn't in a sepulcher. He lost his place of honor in his death. The king started out right, but did not finish right. He did not finish strong. He died with LDDS, latter-day decline syndrome, because he caught King Itis and developed a God complex, and it took him to his grave. And the underlying sin here is P-R-I-D-E, pride, because I am fully convinced, knowing our God from his word, that if when they said, King, this pertaineth not unto thee, if he would have dropped that censer and said, Oh, 
God, I'm sorry. I, I, I messed up. I, I, I wasn't thinking straight. I, I know that to be true. They're right. I'm wrong. Please forgive me. And he began to weep before God for mercy. How many believe God would have forgave him? You're exactly right, church. And how many believes that we would have read a different ending to this chapter? Did he? No. And we read a tragic end of a man who what we would call in our jargon had it going on. God's hand was all over him. God had marvelously helped him. Back to us. When's the last time we've asked God to forgive our pride? To the point of a broken heart. God, I'm sorry. When's the last time we've asked God to forgive our attitude against the pastor? Because he wants to move forward and I don't. Because he's showing the world ain't ever done it that way before. I know that's not grammatically correct, but you've heard it said too. Do you want revival? Just want to take some humbling. Last night we got a glimpse of God lifted high. And we worshiped him. Wasn't that sweet? So now tonight, doesn't it make sense? The next step is when Isaiah came, humbled himself, and he got right. He confessed his sin, and the angel touched his lips, and he was purged, remember? So tonight is a getting right. Tonight is a surrender. Because last night we worshiped. Tonight, his word by his sweet spirit said, Okay, I've said enough. Let's stand. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed, please. If you're here tonight and you're lost, you need to get saved, friend. I'd invite you to come. Let me know who you are, and we'll get somebody to take the Bible and introduce you to Jesus. In church, or friends of this church that are here tonight, I know God's talking to us. We need to find ourselves back at the altar, confessing. That's right, come on, people are coming now. That's fine, come on. We don't even need a piano. If you want to play, fine, but I, I don't think we need it. That's right, obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. If you can't get down on your knees, that's fine. You sit on the front pew, and God, God understands that. Amen. Come on. Obey the Lord, church. Let's move forward here. Amen. Folks are coming all over the place. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's do this. Let's ask him to forgive our pride. And ask him to forgive that arrogancy of flippantly saying oh God I'm sorry and go on like it's no big deal God forgive us amen come on there's still room don't be standing back there and saying I know you can pray in your seat fine but God's wanting us to humble ourselves he wants us to come and get on our knees if we can or not we sit on the front pew and bow our head in fact I'd even go as far to say this Turn around and use your own chair right where you're at as an altar, but meet with God. Amen. Come on.
help you came to get, friend. We can blame the devil for a lot, but we can look in the mirror and see self, self-worship, self-dependence, self-reliance, that pride is just, I'm a, I don't need God, I can get it by, I can get by on my own. It's me, it's me, it's me. And our whole culture is designed to be self-conscious. Right, it's all about our needs. It's all about our wants. It's all about our identity, who we are and what we like and our preferences. Every algorithm written in social media is designed to feed our self and feast on our pride. If it isn't until a meeting like this to shake our heads and wake up out of it like, like we're in a stupor or a dream. Just drunk on our own self-importance, fulfilling our selfish needs. God help us. God help us. And keep praying, keep praying. A couple of folks are just, just praying, amen? It's what we need, it's what we need, it's what we need. Well, we come here to, uh, to get the help that we need, and for the Lord has told us what we need, and it's getting over that person in the mirror, amen? But we can get, uh, our lives uh, can be limited by our own self. You know, we think that uh, pleasing ourselves is the whole crown of our life, right? We've got humanist psychologists that say it's, it's about uh, filling our own needs, right? And that is life. That is our goal in life, to be self-actualized, to fulfill our potential. And there's a lot of good to that idea of our potential and making our time and our, our worth and our talents and our skills count for something with meaning. That, that, that absolutely is a defining element of our life. But that's not the end goal. We are created to give glory to God. Amen. We are created. We are endowed with gifts and a mind and a heart and an emotion and passion and skills to give glory to God. And as much as I can get along the way, hey, praise the Lord. But, but if I have to die, if I have to have pain, and I have to have trouble in this life to bring out more glory, that's what God's called me to do. Now, you're not going to get that preaching on television, amen? Not that I'm more spiritual than the dudes on TV. But don't feast on a prosperity type of a gospel that my Christianity is only successful if I got cars and bills paid and money and all my material blessings are on an extremely extraordinary level. And if I have all these things, then I have God's blessing. That is corrupt preaching through the TV screen, friend. That prosperity gospel is evil and it's wicked. Because it, it, it makes you the, universe, the, the center of your universe. God help us. God help us. You know, you, know, you can't preach that in, uh, in a desert over in Yemen. You can't preach that gospel over there in, 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 a, in, a, in a third world country. Are you listening to me? You could preach it in America because we have resources to abound and, and talk about the blessings of God and vehicles and, 
and blessings and money and, 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 and the, the wealthiest nation on the planet. But you can't go and preach that stuff in a third world country where they're looking for clean water for their kids every day. That the blessings of God are all material things around them. Whatever, God, whatever station that we, we are going through, it's, whatever, it's for his glory, amen? Not for our pleasure. It isn't. Not about us. And not about us. Amen. There's still some folks.